thank you for joining us today. This is Building Your Case, Research Findings on the Business Case for Sustainability. My name is Anthea Rowe. I'm the Content Manager uh, for NBS, and my role is in helping uh, translate and disseminate the great research findings uh, we dig up to business leaders and academics around the world. Uh, we're going to dive in right away today. We've got uh, some opportunities for you to ask questions, so we welcome that. There will be uh, three points at which we pause during the webinar uh, where we invite you to ask questions. You'll see there's a, a question box in your control panel. It might be at the right hand or left hand side of your screen. Feel free to type the questions in there and then I'll address them when we pause for questions. Listening today, we've got uh, a number of academics from around the world as well as a number of uh, business representatives and uh, just some of the uh, sectors covered off. We've got uh, lottery and gaming commissions, telecommunications companies, oil and gas organizations, uh, international banks, and uh, a number of other others. So thanks very much for joining us. I'll give you a, a brief overview of the Network for Business Sustainability. And start these slides off. So NBS exists in order to change business practice by bridging the gap between industry and academia. We've got a network of thousands of academics from around the world at leading sustainability research centers such as Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, um, research centers in Australia, Singapore, Indonesia. And we've also got connections to businesses. In Canada, we have a leadership council of 17 companies. You can see their logos at right on the screen. We've also got a council of small and medium organizations in Canada, as well as 12 industry associations, such as the Retail Council, the Association of Petroleum Producers, and that kind of thing. All in all, we've got about 3,500 uh, subscribers who individually sign up to receive research findings. So thank you to all of you who believe in the value of research to shape business practice. I'm going to hand things over at this point to Dr. John Pelosa, our speaker for the day. Um, John is an NBS topic editor, so he helps ensure the quality of all the content we publish for you at nbs.net is rigorous and relevant. And John is a professor of marketing at Florida State University. He, uh, before academia, worked with a number of companies such as InBev, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Bell, Eli Lilly, and more. And now his research focuses on corporate social responsibility and pro-social consumer behavior. So he'll be speaking to you today. And again, I'll just remind you that if you have questions, we absolutely welcome them. And please feel free to type them at any time into the box on your screen, and we'll answer them when we pause for questions. So now I'll hand things off to Dr. John Pelosa. Thanks, Anthea. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today and, and taking part in the webinar. The um, broad topic um, is, is concerns the relationship between financial performance and, and sustainability or, or corporate social responsibility performance and, and how CSR or sustainability can translate into financial performance for the organization. This research is into its fifth decade, uh, and we've determined um, as a community that there is in fact a relationship between the two. It's somewhat small, but it's definitely positive. Uh, but where we've moved to the last, uh, the last few years, uh, which is particularly exciting, is away from a broad measure of relationship into to disentangling the cause and effect. And so, you know, one of the ways in which uh, researchers have, have determined the, the, the relationship between financial performance and, and sustainability is a bit more nuanced is uh, what you see on your screen, this is a finding by Barnett and Solomon that came up last year that looked at uh, the relationship as a quadratic function, so it's an inverse U shape. So if you do very little, um, you actually, you know, essentially save your money or give it back to investors and, and, and financial performance um, improves. Uh, or if you do uh, a leading amount of CSR and if you're, if you're investing uh, meaningfully in it, you also uh, do better, in fact, even better than if you do none. Uh, but if you're somewhat in the middle, you're kind of in that no man's land and tend to suffer financially and have relatively poor performance uh, relative to competitors. And so this is one of the examples where research is starting to disentangle uh, this relationship and look at some of the mediating processes 
which is exciting, of course, because the broad relationship suffers from questions about cause and effect. So does financial performance lead to investment sustainability versus the other way around? Um, and of course, the, the, the intermediating processes between investments in CSR, sustainability, and an outcome like share price involves a number of different things that have to happen. And the closer we can get to managing those and understanding those, uh, the more we can manage them as, 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 as marketers and as managers and, and impact that ultimate relationship if we can make sure that that mediating process takes place the way we, uh, the way we hope it does. And so that's where some of the research is going. Uh, broadly speaking, we've organized this webinar into three main categories, three main activities uh, that we find uh, do have this effect on financial performance, uh, either through consumer preference, uh, increased share price, a number of different financial metrics that we'll cover through the different studies that I'll, that I'll talk briefly about. Uh, but all of them um, illustrate this contingent nature of the relationship. So it's not just enough to say, put some green products out there, people will buy them, people will pay more for them. Uh, there's contingent factors. It's not enough to say you should donate to charity. There's there's contingent factors and some best practices that research is starting to, to show us. So these are the, the three broad categories we're going to go through, starting with green products. This is the uh, kind of the holy grail, if you will, the, the, the statistic that typically gets widely reported that customers will pay more for green products, products that have some sort of ethical attribute, fair trade, these kinds of attributes. Um, we hear regularly that consumers, um, customers will pay premiums for these products. The question, of course, is, well, if that's the case, why aren't all these products successful? Uh, even at parity pricing, we find that these products don't always move off the shelves and don't always get selected by customers. And so the question then becomes, how do we get this? How do we, how do we achieve that promise of willingness to pay a higher price or preference relative to other products? Uh, and this is where we've seen some, some really interesting work um, in, across a range of fields, Remy Trudeau uh, is forum editor for the Socially Conscious Consumerism Forum, where, where some of this research stems from um, on the customer side. First best practice is this idea of third-party certifications. One of the, one of the things that, that, that I've talked about in my own research is customers, when they're encountering this information about sustainability or social responsibility or some sort of an ethical attribute of a product don't always have the motivation or the ability even to, to fully understand it. So they look to third-party endorsements as a means of, of, of a shortcut, essentially, a mental shortcut, a, a heuristic to say this is credible. So I don't know necessarily what fair trade means, but if there's a credible organization that certifies it, um, that's enough for me and, and, and goes a long way. And in this particular study by, by Remy and June, uh, they found that coffee drinkers in particular were, were significantly uh, willing to pay significantly higher prices for the fair trade beans if they were certified. Without the certification, we didn't see that. So the lesson is, is for managers when you're doing these kinds of activities, uh, borrow the credibility from third party endorsements, the trade organizations, uh, NGOs, different organizations that have that credibility or certification ability uh, that can serve that shortcut uh, function for, for customers. Second, we see that um, the amount uh, that the amount of effort or or perceived effort that customers see in, in companies making these kinds of initiatives uh, matters. And so, in the donation context, we see that the percentage of product sales that go to a charity, in the case of cause-related marketing, the, the donation uh, the donation amount is a signal for customers of the motivations and the amount of, of effort that the company is putting into the actual relationship. And so when the increased, uh, the donation amount goes up, customers perceive that as being higher effort. They see it as being truly caring about the cause. And we know that that impacts the, the emotional response that customers get from this, uh, this added value of, of the donation. In particular, in this study, they found that there was a, a, the largest uh, impact from the increased uh, donation amount comes when the charity has little um, fit with the company. And so fit we define as you know, a pet food company donating to pet shelters. Uh, they find that, that a lack of fit or relatively low fit combined with a high donation amount suggests to customers that there must really be a genuine care for the cause uh, versus some sort of a strategic uh, motive on the part of the company. But certainly donation amount is a signal that Tells, can, tells customers how much the company really cares. Uh, third, and this is ba based on my own research with some of my colleagues, 
Um, we find that guilt, although it does play a role in consumption or preference for products with ethical attributes, um, we find that, that explicit guilt appeals actually uh, has a negative boomerang effect, uh, as with, as with uh, guilt, guilt research in other domains. Um, we used, uh, in one context, fair trade teas uh, and examined a, uh, a simple ethical appeal, positioning ethical attributes without guilt, uh, combined with a guilt appeal, and find that, that significant preference uh, twice as likely, in fact, to prefer the product promoted through a simple ethical appeal. Although the aversion to guilt is certainly driving uh, customer preference, we find that the explicit use of guilt actually has a, a suppressing effect uh, when we try and guilt consumers or customers into, uh, into, these, into these sorts of products. Uh, fourth, we see that there is uh, a perception among some product categories that green attributes or ethical attributes may, in fact, harm performance uh, or there may be some sort of compromise required on functionality. And so when there's a perceived risk of performance failure, consumers actually go the opposite way of the price premium. They demand a price discount. They will still be okay with buying these products. They will still be willing to, to purchase them, but they do expect to be rewarded for, for the kind of risk that they think they're taking on. Uh, and so in some cases, it's not always possible to get the price premium, but certainly it may be possible to... Uh, to, to still sell products or increase preference for products. And so for this, for this finding, it's, a, it's an issue of understanding the perceived risk associated with the product category that you're selling uh, and certainly the, the particular type of sustainability activity, whether or not that increases the perception of risk on the part of customers who would, who would buy your product. Uh, number five, CSR, and this is some really interesting research by, uh, by Torelli and colleagues, they find that when CSR is attached to luxury brands, so so Rolex, Louis Vuitton, these types of these types of brands, um, where the brand value is largely about this idea of dominance, um, uh, indulgence, we find that the attachment of CSR attributes or ethical attributes actually harms consumer preference for these products, um, and it, it comes from a dissonance between the, the the motives underlying purchase of the luxury category and the kind of compassion. Um, emotions that, that this conjures up. We find that there's a disconnect on the part of our customers not wanting to contaminate the, the underlying motive to buy luxury goods with this idea of, of compassion or, or, or taking away from that, that sort of dominance uh, motive. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much, John. Um, what I'm going to do right now is uh, a quick poll of the group to see uh, your thoughts on on the, the findings that you just heard. So I'm gonna, gonna launch a poll there and everyone I just encourage you to, to take a couple seconds and, and click your response. Okay. So were these findings useful? Um, not so useful? Things you maybe heard before? Or are they counter to your experience? So I'll give everyone uh, seven more seconds. Register your your input, and then we'll see see the results. Okay, okay. So I'll uh, I'll close the poll now. We'll see the results. Oh, and sorry about that. I I closed it, but then I. I hit it from view. There we go. We'll share it with you. Okay. So everyone can see that now. So it looks like we've got 94%. Uh, yeah, felt that these were useful. Okay, that's great. So I'm going to open up the comments now and the questions. And just give me a moment here while I make my screen a little more legible. Okay. Uh, yeah, the first question is, will... The first one I saw was, will the slides be available? Yes, absolutely. We're going to email um, a copy of the slides afterwards. We'll upload them to the website and email the link. Uh, and then we'll also put them on SlideShare too and give you that link as well if that's, that's simpler. Okay, so we've got from um, Dr. Cedric Nico. Does that mean that if an organization can maintain little CSR effort, it can maintain its gain it started with? And so I, I presume this is um, speaking to the Barnett and Solomon uh, U-shape relationship. So he asks, if an organization maintains little CSR effort, 
um, can it maintain it, the gain it start? Can it maintain its gain it started with? John, can you speak to that? Yeah. I th well, I think what I think the underlying question is: if you if you do some and then sort of trail off, do you get a link? You know, is there a lag effect similar to maybe advertising, where we know that that advertising effects linger long after the investment is lost? And it's actually something that's going to come up, uh, I think, in the next section. Um, or I think on the reporting section where we talk about the, the need for consistency of reporting. Um, in fact, there's some some initial evidence on a study that I'm involved with with my colleague uh, Todd Green at Sterling that looks at um, some negative effects if, if companies uh, are seen to be cutting back. Once the, once the investment is made, there seems to be this sort of base expectation or a floor effect where now that becomes the minimum expectation and pulling back actually harms um, and so the, the U-shaped Barnett curve is really about not doing it at all or doing it, you know, the, the implicit assumption is on that right-hand side of that curve that if you're going to do it, you're going to do it consistently and, and thoroughly and report uh, consistently uh, over long periods of time where those reputations are, are gained. There's actually a negative effect um, we find in, in sort of the starting and stopping mode. So so the, the Barnett and Solomon curve, it's about that's um, yeah maintaining at those levels, not just reaching them and then stopping. Yeah, they didn't specifically explore consistency, um, but they they looked at amount uh, essentially amount of investment. Um, they used um, the, the KLD, the the, um, the index, which is a five factor model. It looks at community investment, environmental record. You know, it's basically a large, a, a very wide, broad measure of, of uh, social responsibility investment. So they didn't look at consistency, but the consistency issue is something that, in, in, in my own and some other research that, that's recently come out, that uh, it deals with the consistency side of it. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Great. Okay. Um, another person asked, um, can you expand on the first slide? And this is from Simon Chorley. Um, the links between CSR financial performance. And maybe what I, I could suggest here, uh, John, is could you speak a little bit about what Barnett and Solomon, when they developed the U-shaped relationship, what they were measuring uh, CSR performance by, uh, if I remember correctly, it was from KLD index scores, right? Kinder, LIBORG, and Domini. Um, yes. And then, yeah, they used the, the KLD measure. I don't remember uh, offhand the specific. I know there's five factors to it. Um, it's actually it's not no longer available as a metric, um, but it was fairly broad, and there's been there's been some work done that looks at. Um, Specific components of it, you know, they had in many components. There was a, a one-zero metric, so you either, you know, you either did, um, uh, you know, did investments or you did not. There was like a one-zero mechanism, which wasn't, you know, it had it had some issues, but it was fairly broad, and so it it, it looked at philanthropy, it looked at environmental record, it looked at employee treatment, it looked at at a number of different uh, a number of different aspects of. Social responsibility. It was sort of social and, and environmental performance. The financial uh, metric that they use, I don't remember uh, specifically if they use share price or an accounting measure, but it was uh, it was one of the more commonly used. There, there's the two camps of financial metrics that are typically used in those kinds of studies, and I don't recall uh, offhand whether they used share price or an accounting measure, but it was it was it was a it was a widely used measure that they used. You're right. Yeah, I think you're right, John. I, I, if I recall, it might have been uh, return on assets. I think was what they were measuring in one of them. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's see if we can get another two questions at least in before we jump back into the next uh, next category uh, from Isabel Rimanowski. She says, "Why do you think consumption of luxury items clashes with CSR mindset, and what could we do about this?" Well, I think. I mean, I don't, I, you know, it wasn't my research, so I don't know exactly. I know um, some of the work um, that people do on, on what's called what's called ar archetypal branding suggests that for any product category, there are some some very base motives, literally like base to the, to the core of of human behavior and things we associate at a very basic level. Um, and so what what those people would say, and this idea of brand concepts, is that certain brands, it's based on on this idea of archetypal branding. That a brand um, stands for something inherently. That there's something driving that purchase process. And what what my interpretation of that is is that the 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 emotion that comes from consuming in the luxury category 
is driven by this, you know, the feeling of kind of indulgence or dominance uh, over resources. Uh, if you think about what you know, what consuming in that category typically involves, the, the very uh, resource intense uh, goods, uh, very expensive goods, very indulgent goods. And my interpretation of it is the, the dissonance that comes with that motive and the desire to, to experience the emotion of consumption based on that that motivation and this idea of, of intermingling that with some idea of of you know helping those less fortunate um, you know the, the idea of compassion the idea of comparing the uh, compassion of caring of resource conservation uh, it's at odds with the fundamental driver of consumption in that category not to say that people who consume in luxury goods don't share those views but during that consumption experience when they're evaluating brands in that category the conflation the, the intermingling of the compassion and the resource conservation is at odds with with what would be the underlying driver of, of value in that category which is sort of the opposite of that okay Wonderful. So what to do about it I mean it's 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 an interesting <laughs> question I think Companies like that can still do things. I think the way in which you promote them to the to the consumer and the consumption experience is probably better off to be toned down. Um, but as we see, you know, in a lot of the CSR research, it's not just the consumer stakeholder uh, that can provide benefits. And so, the type of activities, even though the consumer might not value them, would still be valuable potentially to employees, to to investors, to to regulators, to other other stakeholders of the company. So it's certainly not some sort of a license to say if you're a luxury brand you can just you know throw caution to the wind and not think about these issues but with the consumer it, it has less of a promotional impact than it does for other categories great and so um, I'm conscious of the time here and we're only about uh, a third of the way through our material um, but there are a number of great uh, questions still to be addressed so uh, John can we take one more and I'll ask if you can keep it to about a one minute response sure. and then um, I'll, I'll put you on the spot here and ask if we can promise to follow up with uh, with, with some answers uh, afterwards, and and I can help do that too, uh, because we don't want to leave you leave you hanging, folks. But we also uh, don't want to take more than the the one hour we've asked of your time. So, John, the last question I'll give for you is um, the finding. Um, sorry, this is from Jocelyn Fraser. She said the finding that consumers believe a non-strategic fit um, in the cause-related marketing research signals commitment poses challenges for companies interested in moving from transactional CSR to transformative. And it's a good point, right, where you, where people like us are often telling companies, you know, don't just hand out money um, and don't just do it willy-nilly, be strategic and develop partnerships and that kind of thing. Um, so her question is, do you see evidence that this finding would be applicable in the extractive sector as well as in the consumer goods sector? So the difference between a company that's selling, let's say, a bottle, a uh, water bottle with a pink ribbon label on it where clearly, you know, the, the cause is um, the breast cancer research or something as opposed to, you know, in the extractive sector where it's not necessarily consumer focused. I know it's not your research, but what do you think? Would yeah, you I think, I mean, well, it's funny because that research specifically um, it raises, is sort of at odds with where a lot of research on fit has been, which is, in fact, exactly that point that um, if you have fit and tie it to specific things like you know company effort, employee volunteerism, expertise, donation of, of resources and company goods and, and time, uh, where that time can add value to a social cause, um, in fact that is seen as, as a positive thing. So I think that that finding is, is, is somewhat at odds and limited to the donation context here and the donation amount being cash. Um, that, that study from 2012 that was referenced was specific to a donation that was made uh, of money. So I still think there is something to be said and there is a literature um, that goes beyond simple cash donations that would suggest that in those donation contexts FIT does play a role and FIT is positive. So I think that's, that's probably a little context specific and I'm, I'm glad that question was asked. Great. Okay, and my apologies, there are about um, seven other questions that we um, haven't yet, and I can see some people saying, how can I get in touch with John? <laughs> so, John, you're going to be a popular person after this. And, and folks, uh, we at NBS are also happy to provide um, as much in the way of follow-up answers as we can for you as well. Um, I should mention now that NBS is actually embarking on 
uh, creating a microsite dedicated to the business case for sustainability, and I welcome um, your input into that. And so if you'd like to request specifically the kinds of answers you're looking for, the kinds of questions you have around making the case, um, and if you want to be a beta tester of the site and tell us what works and what doesn't, we'd love to have you. So I'll have my email address posted and you can connect with me at the end of the, uh, the webinar. Okay, so I'd like to move on. And again, apologies to those of you with outstanding questions, but we will follow up with you, we promise. Okay, take it away, John. Okay, so the second uh, topic, um, and, and these are there's somewhat overlap between these because the research on the business case does stem from a lot of a lot of different um, sources, but a lot of the same sorts of underlying processes. I wanted to specifically go talk about corporate philanthropy um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's certainly um, one of the more common forms of social responsibility initiatives that companies engage in. It's um, it, it's it's ubiquitous, but it's also one of the more visible ones, and so. The kind of things that happen maybe in the supply chain or, or some, of the, some of the other things that companies do are less visible to stakeholders. Philanthropy tends to be one of the more visible uh, initiatives or one of the most visible. So we looked at a couple different questions which are typically asked by managers. How does my company benefit and, and, and can it fix reputation? A lot of companies um, use this strategically to try and to repair, repair damaged reputation or overcome some sort of a controversy by making up for it. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But the, the broad question uh, how does my company benefit? I'm not uh, going forward. There we go. Uh, this really fascinating study by Lev and colleagues uh, came out in 2010. Was one of the one of the really uh, important studies in that it looked at the the lag or the cause and effect in in sort of a one year after um, fashion. So they looked at corporate donations um, here in this case in the retail financial services sector um, of 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 a donation today, what happens to revenue next year? And of course, controlling for lots of other things, controlling for everything else going on in the environment, singled out in this particular context how, um, uh, in their case, they had the raw numbers of $500,000 uh, donation to charity uh, resulted in a, a $3 million uh, change in revenue the next year. And so we know there is this kind of lever that companies can pull. Um, to, to, to pay off, and this was particularly important because it did have this longitudinal cause and effect demonstration. It wasn't just a, a, a single year snapshot where you see both go up at the same time. They saw this lag effect or donations um, lagged, uh, lagged or preceded revenue. So this question of how does it benefit corporate giving really has to do with this idea of, of customer satisfaction, of, of loyalty, of, of, of not just customer loyalty but, but stakeholder loyalty. So this study by Levin colleagues uh, found uh, that it went through uh, the mediating process of customer satisfaction. And so there was this effect of um, uh, on revenue, uh, and they measured customer satisfaction. Particularly, though, they found and they limited their disclosure uh, or discussion of these findings to consumer-driven um, industries. So the resources um, extractive industry might not see the same effects, but in their case, they looked at the financial uh, financial services and retail sectors and found that the mediating process with, with consumers through satisfaction uh, was where that impact was greatest. And so essentially, um, corporate social responsibility is a way to improve satisfaction scores with customers. And of course, we know that satisfaction is tightly linked to revenue and sales and all kinds of wonderful things that happen after the fact. And so CSR linking to satisfaction was particularly meaningful for that study. Uh, second, this, this idea of donate, donating to maintain edge in a dynamic or unstable industry where there's lots of turbulence. So um, in this case, uh, Wang and Choi and Lee in their study looked at um, uh, things, things like knowledge intensity for an industry. So the IT industry, for example, where there's a high degree of turbulence and it's dynamic and tends to be relatively unstable, uh, they find that corporate uh, philanthropy helps improve stakeholder relationships such that um, the environment, uh, stakeholders are more likely to maintain relationships with companies when they see corporate philanthropy as a sign of commitment to stakeholder relationships and company commitment not just to them but to other stakeholder groups and the company's commitment to those outside the company. Uh, and they found that uh, in that uh, in that study that the, the financial benefit uh, worked through stakeholder support and stakeholder relationships, which of course are particularly important if you're in sectors where you rely on other groups or rely on access to knowledge or, or, uh, or the, the 
the resources that stakeholders can withhold. Uh, three, we see this, and again, this sort of harkens back to the, uh, the, the previous graphic that we saw. I mean, if you're going to do this, uh, Barnett and Solomon, uh, uh, based on that, that U-shaped curve that we saw at the start, would suggest that you, if you're going to do it, do it well. Uh, if you're going to do it, be a leader, or don't do it at all. Uh, and so this idea of being sort of on par with the leaders that you're being compared to uh, becomes an important issue. Similarly, in the UK, Brammer and Millington found the same thing. They found the same sort of uh, uh, effect where if you were, if you were average, um, you did not do very well. Those who performed, uh, those who had high levels of philanthropy uh, outperformed. If you, were, if you were average, that was kind of the worst place to be because you didn't get the relationship with stakeholder benefit, you didn't get the reputational benefit, but you still made the investments. And, and so the payoff seems to come from being either at the low end or, or the, the, the real payoff, the higher payoffs even come from being uh, on the higher end. Having said that, of course, uh, we know that simply donating more is not the path to continuously improving profits. And so Wang and Choi and Lee again in their study, well, one of the fascinating things they found is that at some point it does curtail uh, and, of course, turns negative. Uh, so at a certain point, the question in their context was, uh, you know, limited to uh, limited to a certain context, um, particularly in this this idea of IT, um, the IT sector and turbulent sectors. Um, one of the things I think that that we take away from their study is this idea of how much is too much is nothing nothing you can ever really know, uh, given that there's different levels. But I think given the the process of stakeholder relationships, of customer satisfaction. I think the right way to look at this is to look at the competitive set with whom your stakeholders view you as a competitor. And so if it's the case of customers, the most likely reference point would be your direct competitors. So if you're in the, the retail business, what are the other retailers doing? Um, if you're in competing for IT resources or IT employees, the, the other types of places where those types of employees could, could put, their, put their skills to work would be your relevant benchmark. So the, the relevant benchmark is, is most often, more often than not, the competitive set with whom you compete for, for, for every resource that you have, your industry competitors. And it's important to be the among the leaders. You don't necessarily have to be significantly outperforming the leaders, but certainly in the leading group, uh, benchmarking at the high levels where the leaders are, if you're going to pursue the, the philanthropy route and try and be on the right side of that U-shaped curve. Um, the second question here is this, uh, this idea of using philanthropy to fix the damage uh, reputation. Uh, and of course, here the you know the the answer is it's don't hold your breath to to have this happen. It's probably not uh, going to happen. In fact, uh, Mueller and Krausel uh, did this fascinating study where they looked at Hurricane Katrina as a context uh, and found a number of things. First, they found that uh, that event overall had a negative impact on uh, economic expectations, and so stock prices across the board uh, in the U.S. for Fortune 500 firms dropped. Uh, but what they did find is that for companies that had a, a, had a reputation for social irresponsibility or a poor reputation, um, that they dropped more uh, than than the average, and, and the argument being, or the theory being, that the stakeholder support that those companies were going to need to overcome that financial hardship or that economic hardship from Katrina uh, was going to be more difficult. So they were being essentially punished uh, for their previous or prior bad reputation. The other interesting thing that they found was that. Those companies um, who did have those bad reputations or reputations for irresponsibility uh, were more likely to donate, uh, but of course they found that they did not get the benefit from uh, from those donations, and so essentially they, they were not able to repair their reputations uh, by then donating to Katrina or trying to trying to use that disaster as a context to to enhance their image. The other interesting thing that they uh, they spelled out in their paper is that. Although disaster donations are on the rise, if you think about the tsunami in 2005, Katrina, um, you know, it's almost become a standard thing now when those kind of large global disasters happen, companies donate. But we also, they also point out that those disasters inherently lead to economic depression. They, 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 they stymie economies, uh, which should, in fact, have the opposite effect, where, where economic times become hard. Um, the theory is that, that philanthropy becomes more difficult and companies hold back. And what they found is that companies um, who, who didn't donate, they find that there's no, there's no benefit to donating to those things. You're better off, in that case, focusing on the things you need to do to manage the economic situation from it 
uh, when you donate to those things, it doesn't overcome the, the perception um, or the, the, the expected damage that the, the economic hardship does. And so essentially you can't buy your way through philanthropy uh, to a better stock price when there's an expectation that economic uh, times will be tough. And of course the, 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 the ultimate example here is build a reputation that's positive in the first place and it will protect you. There's a number of studies where reputation uh, done by things, uh, activities like philanthropy will protect companies. Um, Janney and Gove in their study looked at action, uh, option backdating as a context where uh, a lot of firms were engaging in this practice in the last decade where uh, they were essentially backdating a lower option price they were granting to, to managers and employees uh, because they, if you could buy a stock at a lower price that's, that's positive, uh, it's essentially a way of the company uh, paying out to its employees by granting lower stock option prices. But of course it was against the rules. SEC decided to, to crack down on this and had a large scale investigation and announced they were going to uh, pursue firms that had engaged in this practice. Uh, and of the firms that had social responsibility reputations that were positive, they saw significantly lower drops uh, in their stock prices. Again, much like with the Mueller and Krauss, there was across the board drops in stock prices, but there was this protection that was offered uh, through a reputation for, for social responsibility, in particular um, through philanthropy. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks very much, John. And uh, I'll just address one of the questions that came up earlier was, um, were the data specific to large companies or were any uh, small and medium enterprises, SMEs, included? And John, am I, am, I, am I fair in saying that the majority of these findings, if not all, are based on large enterprises? Yes, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and it's one of the things uh, that um, I'm working on, uh, again, I mentioned Todd Green's name before, um, he and I are doing some work looking at organization size as a moderator for this kind of support. Um, but it's one of the one of the realities of, of a lot of the business case research, um, if for no other reason, because a lot of the financial data that's available is for index indices like Fortune 500 or large public companies. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, an issue of being both public and large, and those are usually highly correlated, uh, where a lot of this research comes from. So there, there certainly is a skew. Um, there is some stuff out there on small companies, but it definitely does skew toward large. Sure. So stay tuned. We'll we'll get that research published soon on small companies, and we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. And I should mention that NBS uh, has just uh, developed and will, in the next few months, be launching uh, an online resource dedicated to. Um, valuing sustainability for small businesses. And my colleague Maya Fisher here at NBS, she's compiled a bunch of resources on things like, you know, uh, reducing your, you know, changing your thermostat and replacing windows and, you know, all those kind of efficiency operational type things in SMEs and, you know, engaging employees and that kind of thing. Um, so there will be some resources on an NBS's site if you come back to the nbs.net slash valuing page on SMEs. So if I could just ask everyone to do this quick poll again, I'll uh, give you another, you know, five seconds maybe if you haven't submitted your response already. And thanks very much. So we've got about 93% looks like who've said 94 um, that this step was useful. Um, so far, nobody has said that uh, these findings are counter to their experience. So that's interesting because I've had some people tell me they do find that the case. Okay, so we'll we'll close the the poll now and then I'll, I'll publish it for you to see. Great. Okay, so that was uh, people's general reactions to the poll. Now we will uh, open up to questions. And let me get my question box. Oh, it's disappeared on me. Hmm. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, questions and comments. My dashboard is not showing me. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> view. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, we'll try to get as many of these in as we can. Um, so, okay. Ah, uh, certification. Okay. So. What would be the difference of impact between a retail business 
oh, this is, sorry, returning back to responsible products, which we can do if there aren't many questions about the, um, uh, about the corporate philanthropy. Um, let's see, corporate philanthropy. Do you consider CSR an investment in the organization? Um, if so, then there can never be any generosity in a company's giving due to the expected return on investment. So that's a good question. You know, is there an extent to which companies should just do it because it's the right thing to do and it's a reflection of values as opposed to always trying to put a dollar figure on it? What's your, what are your thoughts on that, John? Uh, yes, um, I certainly do. Uh, I mean, I, one of the things that I've given up trying to do a long time ago is to try and understand if managers really care or if they just say they care. Uh, and I could never go into the hearts of managers and, and really know what's going on. Uh, I certainly know that if you know, in the case of the SMEs we were talking about, if it's if it's your money, you know, you can do what you want with it, and, and maybe you care, maybe you don't. Uh, but nobody can question you. I know in the case of large organizations, certainly public organizations, there is a lot of pressure to to show a business case. So whether or not somebody really cares or not is is you know, part of the question. But but. You know, the, they're not going to have access to the resources unless they can demonstrate to people who might not care uh, that in fact there is some sort of a financial return for it. And it's not necessarily a positive thing. In fact, there's some interesting research that shows that certainly consumers look at companies that do this and say they should get something back for this. It's not, it's not as if you can uh, sort of not say, okay, we're totally in this for, for the, the good of others. Uh, there is sort of an implicit assumption that the company does it a little bit because they want something back. There's some nuance around how that's communicated, but it's not really seen as a negative thing by most, by, by, certainly by the consumer stakeholder, uh, that companies would do this in part to get something back. I mean, they, they definitely don't want to see greenwashing. They don't want to see, uh, you know, sort of questionable tactics or over-promotion, the kind of things where, you know, these famous examples like Philip Morris where they, Donated 30 million to, uh, to to literacy and spent 100 million telling everybody about it, or I can't remember what the numbers were. Um, so you know there are those kinds of issues where you can't, you know, there's there's a certain boundary. But by and large, people are are willing to accept the fact that there should be some, you know, good companies should be rewarded for doing some of these things. Okay. Well, I'm conscious of our time. We've got 17 minutes until two o'clock, and we've still got content to go through. But there are a couple other questions, John. So I think we have time for one more, and I'll ask you to keep it to one minute. Sure. Um, this comes from uh, Marc Andre Malo, and he asks, "How do these findings relate to companies not on the stock market?" Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, th that's part of the issue: is the data for those companies is just not readily available for researchers, and so that's why there's a skew toward public companies here. Um, the theory, however, should hold. I mean, the, the the theory that, and this is one of the stakeholders we're going to get into in the next section. They're they're really investment analysts, which are are really specific to public companies. But if you're looking at the underlying processes and, and those mediating mechanisms, which are again the, the important part of this research. Um, there's no theory, there's no reason why that wouldn't hold for a company that's not traded publicly. If you think about the importance of stakeholder relationships, of, of stakeholder commitment to a company, um, of reputation, of, of the consumer trends and support for these kinds of things. So there's theoretically there's no reason why it should be different based on public or private. Um, although there is some interesting research um, just coming out now in the last couple of years by another colleague of mine that looks at form of ownership as as a way in which consumers make inferences about companies' commitment. So the jury's sort of out. But the underlying theory, I think, is that is that a lot of these relationships with stakeholders should hold regardless of, of public or private status. Okay, great. All right. Um, if we if we have time to return to some of these questions, then I promise that we will. But at this point, we'll, we'll press on. And John, I'll remind you that we've got um, 15 minutes or less. Sure. Well, I'll go faster than I ever have before. <laughs> well, <laughs> next topic is CSR reporting, uh, which kind of takes all these things that we've been talking about and says, okay, how and why should we tell anybody about this? Uh, CSR reporting, of course, is much more broad than simple philanthropy or what they're doing in product development. But we know that the kind of reporting that companies do leads to, um, in particular, benefits from being involved in social indices. And so we know that. When you're on one of these indices, um, you know there's not necessarily a benefit from being added. But if you're taken out of an index because the reporting no longer is there, or your reporting doesn't provide the right sort of uh, benchmarks for your company to be in that index, there's a significant 
detriment. And this comes from this idea of, of how institutions and legitimacy that comes from the indices and the kind of the institutions around measurement um, do lend credibility. And so this speaks to that earlier question about um, commitment to, to a, and consistency to, to a cause. Um, if, you're, if you're put onto a social index, there's a significant uh, detriment if you now withdraw that support and, and, and withdraw support from CSR. Uh, and, and in part, it works through this idea of transparency and reporting. But the, the, the simple question is, you know, stakeholders care, whether it's employees that care and uh, customers that care. Certainly an investment analysts who look at this kind of reporting by and large infer that what they're, to what they're hearing from the company um, is going to be something that matters to stakeholders like customers, like employees. And so that's how the mechanism works. Usually it's not consumers or employees who read these reports, uh, but the investment analysts understand that the risk that comes from the, 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 the reporting or the risk that comes from lack of reporting manifests through through detrimental relationships with, with groups like consumers or, or, uh, or employees. So this idea of transparency, um, you know, those that integrate this kind of reporting, social environment reporting into financial reporting experience lower price volatility. And, and the theory here is that there's just clear definition of, of risk exposure. I understand that you as a company uh, understand these risks and I know what you're doing to mitigate them versus this black box of not knowing if you understand the risks or what you're doing to, to comprehend uh, or to, to build contingency plans. So this essentially is, is, is a risk management story, lowering volatility. Uh, we also see that it strengthens market value. We see this idea of consistency being particularly important. So again, back to this point, it's not enough just to do it, but it's the consistency. And the title of this article, uh, you know, looks at looks gives it away. The title of the article: A New Look at the Corporate Social Financial Performance Relationship, the Moderating Roles of Temporal and Interdomain Consistency in Corporate Social Performance. So, when you choose to do something, stick with that thing and stick with it consistently. And if you do those things, you'll see significant improvements in market values and, and share price. Uh, this, again, is similar to the point we mentioned earlier, this idea of competitive edge in industries where product differentiation is difficult. So it's not necessarily just consumer products, although often that's where you see product differentiation being particularly challenging. Um, in this case, they found from, from the Spanish experience, a phone company that actively sought CSR, uh, improved brand integrity and the willingness to play uh, uh, willingness to pay a price premium. And so working through brand effects, working through reputation, similar to the satisfaction uh, mediation that we saw from the, from the previous study is how they say these things are working or why they say reporting results in these kinds of outcomes. In terms of what to report, the basic story here is uh, reporting outcomes, not goals. And so this is kind of a, a two-part um, slide. Uh, the folks, uh, Bush and Huffman, looked at energy intensive companies and found that in achieving emission reduction targets results in higher performance Q, which is essentially a market multiple uh, measurement, so market value divided by book value, um, versus just those who had said, um, I've simply reduced my emission. And so if I report reducing a specific amount that met a goal, it means much more and I receive um, higher market, market cap uh, in response than just saying, here's what I've done. And the issue here seems to be one of framing it for the audience. So framing it as an accomplishment, framing as an achievement. And we know that, that goal setting and framing of outcomes to goals um, is, is more meaningful for audiences than simply saying, here's what I've done in the context, or without the context of a, of a goal achievement. And the last point here is disclosing mistakes. So this comes back to that option backdating scandal, where uh, when the SEC had announced they were going to do this, uh, and investigate companies, some custom, some companies basically took their chances and said, well, we'll be quiet. Others had sort of voluntarily disclosed this information and says, we've, we've done this. We're going to sort of admit to our wrongdoing and take our lumps. And they saw almost a full percentage point less drop in those in their stocks, even though they had come out and voluntarily disclosed this. Um, and the others were exposed, of course, it's, it's much more damaging. Uh, and so the, you know, the lesson here is when you see a potential a potential problem on the horizon, get ahead of it, disclose it. Um, this is something that you know, has been learned in the PR field for, for decades now, ever since the Tylenol issue from the 80s. Similar to that, when you see these kind of things coming, the best, the best advice always is to get in front of it, disclose it, and, and try and uh, keep ahead of the, of the scandal. Okay. Oh, sure. 
Well, wonderful. Thanks, John. And uh, I have to admit that the uh, the Bush and Hoffman study is a little bit frustrating in the sense that it suggests, uh, you know, if investors reward results, it almost makes you feel like companies should set their goals lower, and then when they achieve them, they get rewarded more than setting, you know, reach goals that they maybe don't always achieve. Um, but I guess such are the vagaries of, you know, market analysts. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so I'll throw up for the group. This is the final time, I promise, that uh, we'll do a quick feedback poll for you and leave it open for um, about five seconds. Appreciate your thoughts. And then uh, we'll dig into the comments and questions. Okay, so two more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, and I'll share the results. So this section looks like was um, there were more people who felt it wasn't as useful. And um, if you have feedback on that, we definitely welcome it. I know there the CSR reporting there are any number of things that we could talk about. So if you have specific questions or requests, please I invite you to to email me afterwards. Um, I welcome that input. Okay, I'll close that poll and then pull up our. Um, questions that remain and we'll get through to the end here. I'll make a let you know for those of you who do have to get off uh, before two o'clock that I, like I said I welcome you to email me Anthea Rowe at A-R-O-W-E at NBS.net and as I mentioned earlier we are going to be developing a, uh, a website dedicated to the business case for sustainability and helping sustainability managers uh, make the case either upwards to senior leaders or you know downwards to frontline employees and this will be a, a suite of statistics and resources just like the ones you saw today so if there are things that work well things that are missing um, do let us know we know that we don't have all the answers uh, yet and and may not ever have them all but at least we can offer what we've got okay in terms of the questions from the crowd we'll just expand my notes here okay so um, let's scroll down to the bottom okay will the slide deck be available yes absolutely so we will email a copy of the slides to every participant then you can also forward it um, to colleagues uh, we encourage you to spread them wide and far and uh, they'll be posted to the website as well uh, we have a question from Mark Andre again what medium of reporting and frequency would be most rewarded? Well, that's interesting. And I know I should also mention that we lumped, you know, CSR reporting, we lumped in many things in terms of the firm communicating themselves via, for example, CSR reports and sustainability reports, as well as responding to, um, uh, you know, rankings and indices like the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and that kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, John, I know this isn't necessarily your area, but you wanted to take a quick 30 second stab at Marc Andre's question. What medium for reporting and frequency do you yeah, think well, would be most rewarding? It really sounds like an interesting research project because I don't, I don't, I assume that I've never seen anything that looks at, at type of reporting. The, the one finding suggests that integrating it into financial reporting, which would suggest either a quarterly or a yearly uh, cycle, um, suggests that that's one way to go. But I don't know that I've ever seen actual testing of different different reporting media uh, but again this the reporting media would be specific to certain audiences so typically investment analysts are on the on the investment side um, on the finance side you, you'd see that reporting being accessed um, you know I don't know to what extent other other regular stakeholders like regulators would use it I think it might depend on, on who the stakeholder you're trying to talk to is but but it's an interesting question I've not seen anything that looks at those that that is a moderating variable for success interesting okay great um, we don't have any other questions specific to reporting so we can go back we've got about uh, two minutes here I'll let everyone wrap up uh, before two o'clock but um, we have a question from Sergey Chirtok who asks is it fair to say philanthropy so this is going back to the previous section philanthropy is less effective for companies that do not sell directly to consumers and I think you spoke briefly to this certainly the return on investment would be smaller yeah I mean some of the some of the studies did find that particularly it was particularly effective in consumer driven categories uh, or in, in, in categories where, where you'd expect consumer driven um, 
participation, things like where differentiation is, is particularly important, the effects of brand are more important. Uh, I don't know that those studies necessarily show that it's not important, but I think it's definitely possible to say it's less important if you look at what the data show. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I think uh, that we've hit off as many of the, the questions that are broadly applicable to the group as possible. Um, so uh, I'll say to the group again, uh, to CSR managers and sustainability managers out there, if you or a member of your team is interested in uh, providing input into NBS resources on this front, we absolutely welcome it. Please e email me. Um, and thank you very much to Dr. John Flosa from uh, Florida State uh, professor of marketing who is taking the time today to share with us some of these research findings. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for coming, everybody. Okay.